So hello everybody, thank you for joining me. Um, my name is Giuseppe Bonocora. In this session we were supposed to be with Giuseppe Brignesi, but he got sick. And this is the reason why you go in a presentation with two Giuseppes, because of I have a little bit of <laughs> So first of all, this is a session about K-Native. Uh, I walk through about what I've learned about the community and what, where the community is going on and what are the projects and what is KNAD, of course. This is uh, something for starters, so people that never heard about KNAD, I hope to keep it as basic as possible, but feel free to ask me questions. So, first of all, this is the bad fun of this presentation. What is this? Many of us already seen this picture. This is a serverless data center. So, <laughs> Any server. Of course, anybody that uh, hear about KNATIVE, they think about serverless, which is good, but we will see that there is more to elaborate on. So, this is the definition from Wikipedia about what serverless is. Basically, it points out two things I've tried to highlight with, with bold character. You talk about cloud provider, so it takes that, that a cloud provider is something needed for any serverless. Uh, I think we can think also about automation, not just cloud provider in the meaning of public cloud, but also something on premise, like in the Kubernetes, or like in the something heavily automated in your own data center. So in the reality, it, of course, the, the picture is fake, it's not without server, but it's with heavily automated servers. You need a lot of servers for less serverless. And uh, a point that is highlighted is about pricing, because one of the reasons why there is all this fed about uh, serverless is because of a different pricing model, which can be direct in terms of public cloud provider. We will see that Lambda, of course, is one of the most recognized uh, offering the, in the functional service and serverless uh, market, but it's not the only way. It's not only about pricing the meaning of a public cloud, but also pricing the meaning of consumption of your own resources. And another very important thing is that it simplifies the way of deploying, of deploying sorry, code. So the code is centric into serverless. Uh, if w the whole idea of serverless is automating the stuff in the way that you can really focus just about code and not about the infrastructure. Of course, it's a promise. It's not so easy to keep it, but this is the, the main goal of all the serverless movement. How does it work? It's very simple, of course. You have an event, you have a function, and you have a result. So input and output. The idea is that the input comes from an event. So uh, hopefully in an async way, we may have a message coming into a queue. We'll see the, the architecture of Kinetic. You will have very simple code. So this is another key point. The function is usually very simple code in the meaning that you may not have the usage of the full libraries of your language. But it's something very simple that has very specific use case, and you will see also that. And you will have a result. Of course, the result is necessary to understand where the computation is going on. Of course, this is the main point of the serverless. <coughs> so, if you will have a look at the roadmap of, of, I would say, of the history of serverless, we will see that the first uh, tentative on serverless is recognized as. AWS Lambda, so the, the Lambda expression, and indeed, if you talk to, to the people on the, on the market, to customers, about serverless, most of them, they say serverless equals to AWS Lambda, and this is the first experiment, actually, of this kind of computational model in which you define a function, and somebody else uh, puts also the structure, all, all, all the structure, all the infrastructure needed for your function to run. Then we start thinking some kind of community, you can see IBM OpenWisk, which is a project which Red Hat collaborated on, which is the tentative to keep this, this AWS Lambda style of doing things in a, in a private cloud or on your own data center, is something with a Ninja, I think it, it's something that you can use basically on your own infrastructure. Then we have other players jumping on the ship. We see Azure Function, we see Google Cloud Function, and we see also that um, the community is shifting towards Kubernetes. So, we see a lot of frameworks that are native for Kubernetes for doing serverless, for doing function as a service. Of course, Knative, which is something really new, I think less than one year, uh, it's something that is heavily based on Kubernetes and is an effort that 
comes into, into the road to a standardization of the way of serverless and, and FAS and function as a service are done. The main question for us, as Red Hat, as an open source company, is is serverless open source, is, there is the possibility to make this kind of thing that are heavily related on, on how the infrastructure is implemented, just think about AWS Lambda, to make it open source, so to make it a standard in the way of having your code and having this code with the possibility to run it on different cloud function providers, on different function as a service providers. The answer, of course, as with containers, as with the other technologies, is about standards. So we are in touch with Cloud Native Company Foundation, and the main sub-project is Cloud Events. And the idea is to create some standards in order to have specifically the, the references on how the language must be developed, I'm referring to the functions, in order to be executable on different function as a service providers. So the answer is standards, and of course, as many of you already know, Cloud Native Company Foundation is part of Linux Foundation, so it's something really serious about open source. This is the serverless landscape. So you can see uh, an up-to-date version of this map at that URL, s.cncf.io. This is part of the biggest uh, cloud-native landscape that many of you probably already know. And it lists all the available <laughs> platforms and frameworks and tools in order to implement uh, the, the, the basically the serverless and the FAS. There is a project from AWS. There should be somewhere uh, OpenWhisk. There are a lot of vendors and projects that participate in this landscape, in this landscape of Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So now to KeyNative. If you go to the KeyNative GitHub, this is how the project is presented. So KeyNative is a way of extending Kubernetes, providing a set of middleware components. This is a very important because we are talking about something that stay on top of the platform in the same way of middleware stay on top of on a operating system, on a traditional operating system. And the idea is that it's essential to build modern in, in, in the way of the paradigm. So function as a service oriented application, source centric. So as we stated about the source code, the presence of the source code, the way of you focusing just on developing your business logic is crucial and container-based. This is also most very important, of course. It's something um, that you can make forgiven because it's on top of Kubernetes. So, so far, Kubernetes is the, the, the best way to host your containers, but it's very important to stress about that all this stuff is container-based. And the idea is that you can run it anywhere, of course, because of containers, because of Kubernetes. So in the cloud, in your data center, where you want on-premise, of course. This is the community behind KNative project, project. So you can, we can see that IBM jumped on the train and I think they are doing their own consideration on how to integrate KNative with OpenWIS, but this is my personal opinion. We have read that and same year, we did some investment in OpenWIS. So the idea is that at some point in time there will be some, some joining with KNative. We have Google, which is probably the, the, the founder or one of the first founder, and we have Pivotal. So what's KeyNative about? We have three main pillars. The first one is build, and we got this amazing IKEA uh, shit on, on how to build stuff. Uh, so the idea is to have a pluggable model in order to build your own artifacts that may be code artifacts like jar files or I don't know, NPM or stuff like that. And also containers, starting from source code. So uh, we stressed a lot about the fact that function as a service and serverless make the main focus point on source code. Then we have serving, that is um, probably the, the most important thing in the, in the whole architecture. So the idea is that is an architecture that can serve event to your source code and that can have the ability, ability to scale to zero. This is very important because um, all the point about serverless is the ability to spike. So to have zero instance of your code when it's not needed and then when an event comes you can scale up to the, the number of copies of your code, of your container that you need. So this is very important. Probably the most important feature of serverless is the ability to scale to zero and then scale up to uh, the resource needed to complete your task. So serving is a very important pillar in the K-native architecture. And the last but not least is the eventing infrastructure. So all 
which is about uh, the way to deliver events in terms of messages and calls and data to your funds, to your functions, sorry. By the way, uh, how many of you recognize what this event is? Metallica concept? No, not Metallica, it's Iron Maiden concept. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, a bit more in deep dive. What's a build? All those concepts in Knative are implemented as CRDs, so Kubernetes Custom Resource Definitions. And a build is basically essentially a list of containers that are run in order, one after the other, in order to basically uh, implement your building steps. So it's something very similar to what you can do with a pipeline in Jenkins. And indeed, uh, the community is now uh, wondering if there is a way to evolve this build concept into pipeline concept because they are very similar. Uh, you can also have build templates, so the same thing as a build, but, uh, but in a template, so it's something you can reuse in, in a better way. And the whole idea is that you run also all these steps, all these containers, one after the other, and you have some kind of shared file system between each step. That could be a Git repo, that could be a basic file system, in order to work on partial artifacts. So you may have, I don't know, if it's a Java build, you may have Maven artifacts and dependencies, and then you have a jar that is produced, and then you have this jar that is containerized into a, a container, so it's packaged into a container, so you have one step after the other. Each of the steps is uh, sharing the output of the previous step, if there is one. For the one of you that are familiar with OpenShift, this is somewhat similar to source image. So the whole idea is that they give you a standard way to implement a source to image natively on Kubernetes concepts. Serving, serving is uh, related to the part of routing traffic. So as many of you can imagine, is heavily uh, based on Istio. And there are some basic concepts. The most uh, important concept is the service, which is not the Kubernetes service and make a lot of confusion, but basically is a high level concept of having grouped uh, the other pieces of the serving architecture, which are the route, which is an ingress into your code, so the way to route the, the, the live traffic, the live messages into your code. You have the concept of the configuration, which is basically the state of your deployment, so your application code plus your configuration files. And you have the concept of revisions, which are like snapshots of the configuration. So every time you change your configuration, you will have a new revision. And this is somewhat similar to what you can do with Istio when you have AB releases or Canary or stuff like that. You basically have many different revisions of your code and via the route, you can bring the traffic or the messages into different revision um, following some kind of configuration or rules that are uh, basically the, the Istio rules. So the service is just a logical grouping of all these concepts altogether. <clears throat> the last point, which in my personal opinion is less mature of the, of the product, but is, is already uh, out and you can have a look at GitHub, is the eventing uh, pillar of, of, of Knative which is designed in order to be consistent with the specification of cloud native cloud events. And basically is a way of abstracting from a specific queue provider, from a specific broker. So you may have many different actors. In this case, you have the sources, which are the, the, the event producers. You have the event consumers, which are of two kinds of family. The first family is the addressable family that basically implement the ability of receiving a messaging and hacking the receiver of the message. And the Kubernetes service are a particular implementation of addressable, so they are consumers. And you can also have the callable that are a bit more compl complex because they can receive events and transform the content. And you have the channel, which is probably the most intuitive uh, concept in this architecture. And basically is a name at endpoint which implement the brokering functionalities. Indeed, it's often implemented by Kafka or IMQP. It's basically the provider of the messaging persistence and delivery guarantees and all that kind of stuff. The last concept is the subscription. That is the link between a channel and a service or a consumer. Anyway, it's a way to link the consumer to the broker or the producer to the, bro to the broker. It's <coughs> exactly the subscription, as the name says. So what's interesting about all the Knative CRDs is that they map one-to-one -one with, the 12 fact with some of the 12 factors uh, principles. As many of you know, the 12 factor principles 
uh, which are on, on the website, wellfactor.net, are the way to develop cloud-native applications. And you may see that there is a one-to-one -one, uh, pointer. I'm not going through all of these points, but as an example, uh, the, way the, the, the idea of having the configuration strictly separated from the code is something that is very well implemented into Knative. I don't know how many of you know this graph. Basically, this is Pizza as a Service. It's, it's um, an evolution. We had many, many different versions of this. There is the author there. You can have a look at this blog. And basically, it's a way to uh, explain the concept of uh, something as a service with pizza. So you may go from the homemade, in which you manage basically everything from, from the oven to the conversation with your friends. And you may have the party in which you may have that all the infrastructure has been managed by the party host, and you just bring your conversation. And this is a metaphor for a different kind of something as a service. So you may start from the traditional on-premise, which is like making your own pizza at home, and you manage everything, through party, which is software as a service. You just put your data and everything is implemented. As you can see, there is also a bit before software as a service that is function as a service. What is the idea? The idea is that in the, in the metaphor, you may have to bring friends. In the real life, you have to bring just functions. What is this about? The idea is that Knative does not implement a, a method for having a runtime of function. It just provides you the infrastructure. So the build, and you can build the container. It provides the way to put your messages and your events into the container, but does not provide a specific runtime. What's into the container? In other words, it's almost up to you. It's not really true, but I would say it's up to you. You can put anything on the container. You can have a facility that spin up the container when to receive a message. But there is no concept of runtimes, so the real language implementation. So the idea is that you are not fully on a fast implementation with Knative. Knative just manages the serverless implementation, but does not do the last step, which is the functions runtime. And indeed, if you, do a look, if you have a look at the CNCF serverless white paper, it specifically stress on the bundled as one or more functions has to be, a fun uh, I would say, function as a service compliant if there is a compliance. So the idea is that serverless is all the set of the infrastructure, so the storage, the messaging, the events, and function as a service is the implementation of the real language. So you have, with, with Knative, you have all the infrastructure. You can do fast, but you have to do your last step on your own. What's the project? So what's, what's the, the community and Red Hat looking into is having this kind of architecture in which you can have, of course, RHEL, CoreOS as, as the foundation. You may have, of course, Kubernetes of the, of the orchestration of containers. You may have many different components provided by OpenShift, and Knative probably will be one of them, or any way will be in strict relation with the OpenShift. And then you will have a very thin layer of function as a service provider that may be OpenWiz, may be OpenFast, uh, most people is looking into kubeless, so very thin runtime in order to provide just the last mile of language runtime into your serverless architecture, into your, into your function as a service architecture. What are the common use cases of all these serverless implementation, all these function as a service? Well, most of them, they uh, come into life with cloud provider and so are related to tasks that are burstable. So stuff like uh, uh, having scheduled tasks, you have to do something at midnight, some kind of computation, and then at, at one o'clock is end, and you, you want to uh, shut down everything. Uh, you may think about image manipulation. So think about online newspaper or website or something that have a bunch of photographs, and they need to convert it for many different devices. And they can do it in a burstable way and just use, use and pay the computational resource they need in that, in that uh, specific moment. You can think about other um, encoding stuff like video encoding, audio encoding that are heavily dependent on a peak of traffic and then can be uh, just shut down. And most uh, use cases are coming from stuff like IoT, from stuff like uh, processing um, voice recognition devices like Alexa, like uh, Cortana, and stuff like that. And of course, stuff like chatbots in which you will have the interaction, the interaction just when somebody messages you and you have to process the message. When not to use serverless? Basically, when you have strict dependency on the latency of the application, because of course, the spin up of the first container may be something computational heavy. Of course, they are working on 
to avoid this penalty, but there is a penalty. The long-running task that basically can't be split into specific steps, so that can't uh, take advantage of the parallelization of the task. When you have very huge memory and CPU requirements, so the idea is to have small step with low requirements and non, not one huge step with heavy requirements. And especially when you can't deal with a cold start. So when you need something that has a warm up of caches or stuff like that, this is not good because as we have seen, in serverless you start from scratch every time. So I think that we are okay. We are in time, so we have a couple of minutes for questions. Please be. <laughs> What's the long run? So you say long run, what counts? Like five minutes, seconds, hour? That's a good, a good question. I don't think I don't think there is a rule on this. It's probably oh sorry, I repeat the question for recording. The question is uh, what is a long running task? I don't think there is a specific definition. I would stress more on parallelization of stuff. So if your task is heavily par parallelizable, it's probably a good fit for this kind of runtime. But I don't, I would not see like if it's a matter of minutes, it's a long task. Probably if it's a matter of hours, it's not a good fit. But there is an, an, an there, there is not a specific rule on this. Yes? Uh, what are the channels for passing the events uh, supported out of the box? So the question is, if there are uh, some kind of channels supported out of the box in, in Knative, I would say that Kafka is probably the, the most used implementation so far. I don't think there is any uh, official support so far because the project is incubating. I would expect at least Kafka and probably some main Q provider like uh, Active and Q, stuff like that, are tennis. Sure. So the question is, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I already have a, an infrastructure on premise, what is the advantage of having workloads as serverless as I'm still paying for the whole infrastructure? So the answer is that with serverless, you can mix workloads in a better way. So if you have, I don't know, batch work, if you are a bank and you have batch workloads that run at night, and then you may want to have more computational power at the day because you have, I don't know, your people coming to branch offices, you can mix the workload in a better way. So you just use the computational power for batch on that specific day. Of course, it is something that you can do also with containers, but hopefully with function as a service, it will be more granular. Personally, I don't think we will migrate everything on function as a service, but it could help in a heavily microservice-oriented architecture because it can <coughs> make some glue here and there. We have time for other questions. There are other questions. Thank you very much.